<laughs> you know what? If your fit up game is like this bad, then not knowing how to bridge a gap isn't the problem. <laughs> All right, let's get. So the episode about bridging gaps in thin metal has, uh, I don't know, gained some traction here a little. It's got a couple hundred thousand views by now. And uh, the request to do the exact same thing or demonstrate it on thin aluminum has pretty much broken the inbox. So that's what this episode's all about, how to bridge gaps in very thin aluminum. So let's start with machine settings. So our material thickness is aluminum, it's 063 or roughly 1.5, 1.6 millimeters, somewhere in that range, right? We need to set our machine settings, usually at the one amp per thousandth of an inch range is where people like to go, and a lot of people say on aluminum, go just a little bit higher. So normally you would set it around maybe 60 to 75 amps, somewhere in there, and that's comfortable for a lot of people. But there are two types of welders in this world. They are the hot and heavy type and the low and slow type. Neither one of those styles is incorrect, but here's the difference. Hot and heavy types of welders will take that material thickness settings or the average recommended settings that you would do and jack it way up above and beyond that. They want to get their puddle fast, they want to get in, out, and move along that thing and they want complete control. Normally they'll start out full throttle, heavy footed, and come off of it slowly and taper off as they weld. That's one way of doing it. That's a hot and heavy type. Now the low and slow, they'll go around the machine settings, the recommended uh, amperage settings per thickness, and maybe a little bit less. So they'll go maybe 50 to 60 amps, and they will wait on that puddle. They'll basically get in on it, just stack it up, one dab, one bead, one dime, whatever, at a time, and just with precision, slowly stack it up and throttle that pedal back and forth. They basically patiently wait on it to form and do what they want to do. Again, neither one of these is wrong. There is no right or wrong to welding as long as the result is correct. And if whichever style you are, that's what you need to run with. Now, I'm a hot and heavy type of welder. I love my machine settings on aluminum way up above and beyond, and I want complete control over it. So I'm going to take this 063 or 1.6 millimeter uh, aluminum, and I'm going to start running somewhere around maybe 90 to 95 amps. I have all the power in the world, and it's at my foot. Let's explain that. Now this may seem a little bit like, huh, durr, but you know, at the same time, it's often overlooked. Remember one important part. All the power in the world is right here at this pedal, which is normally on your foot, but either way you slice it, no matter what you set that machine to, if you set it to 95 amps, you step on this pedal all the way, you get 95 amps. No more, but you do get less. So as you back off, you get, you know, less movement. But the idea here is to correctly match it to where you want your settings to be. Because if you go at 90 amps and you back off to about 50% pedal, you know you have about 45 amps. Now, if you jack it all the way up to like 200 amps to weld this or whatever the case is, you know that you're going to be spending your time, most of your time at about 50% throttle or less, which basically means you have less control over that amperage because it's a more narrow range versus if you have it set correctly to where you want, you have more range to finely and precisely dial in where you want, which is exactly what you need to do when it comes to bridging these gaps because we need complete puddle control. Now there are people that will argue that it's all about the frequency that you set your machine to that will dictate how much control and all the rest of that you have over your puddle. Now control is exactly what we're after on this one. Now here's the basically the low down on frequency. The lower the frequency you have, you essentially get a kind of gooey low setting puddle that expands rapidly. And if you have a higher frequency setting, you have a, a puddle that kind of stays narrow and solidifies very quickly. Now neither one of those are incorrect, but the idea is to balance it out. You want the complete control over that puddle. You need to be able to basically run a puddle in midair and bridge it over, which we'll show you that in a minute. But ideally here, you're looking at some sort of setting on your frequency that's going to keep it nice and solidified, nice and tight, but maintain that penetration. So if you go too high on your frequency, you're just going to get stacks that bridge across there that might uh, not have the strength that you actually need in it. And if you go too low, you're going to have a hard time building that bridge or at least uh, maintaining that puddle in thin air and getting it over the top and uh, getting it right to where you need it. So again, you're going to see that. Now me personally, 
I'm gonna stick with my common settings, maybe go a little bit higher. I usually like to weld aluminum somewhere around 100 to 110 hertz on the frequency, but I'm gonna go up to probably about 120, 125, just to give me a little bit more freeze on that one and a little bit tighter uh, precision on it. I don't wanna go too high. I'm also not going to set the machine up to anything special other than a random, uh, standard square wave, or at least in this case, in the Everlast PowerTig 255 EXT, it's called the Advanced, advanced Square Wave. Uh, but no triangle, no none of that stuff. Nothing fancy about it. We're just going to go right into this thing. So let's start by getting it all tacked up. Now this should go without saying, but I got to say it anyway. Make sure your pieces are nice and clean and prepped and ready to be welded. That way it's going to make it a lot easier for you. So a good brush, clean with some acetone, something like that. Uh, or if you just want to weld them flat out and just, you know, with a mill finish on it and, uh, you know, just straight up clean it with acetone, doesn't really matter. So we got to tack these together or uh, at least get them fit so that they're in the same place. Now there's no way we're going to be able to tack that bridge or that big giant gap or build a bridge over it without it being held together. So obviously we got to actually go through and uh, set it all up and get attacked. Now aluminum is not famous for uh, liking to be autogenously welded together or welded without filler. So if you are not good at this or you're not you know fantastic with speed tacking or running autogenous tacks or anything like that, just have a little bit of filler rod at the ready. But basically what's going to happen is I'm going to go into it, just get the arc initiated, and I'm going to kind of pulse it a little bit with the actual pedal and I'm going to work and watch that puddle form and hope that it kind of grabs and gets together. Now as soon as I have that it's going to get weak it'll it'll just literally flex and, and and fall apart and it's not like steel or stainless steel if you ever autogenously tack that together so you have to be very very delicate with it uh, because it is kind of fragile so after I get the first one down we get the second one the third one and then we're gonna get welding now there is pretty much nothing special about welding this. It's just a you know your typical average ordinary everyday regular weld just to stick it all together. Now it might want to pull and distort and open up that gap a little bit, but that's the purpose of having the tack welds on there. And of course, be honest with yourself. If your autogenous tacks don't hold, go over there and give them a little extra dab or two, so that way they don't crack and split or anything like that. But either way, run your bead, make it as however you like it, and uh, you know just kind of get on with it. Alrighty. Not too bad. Could be a little bit more uniform, but hey, you know what? This is uh, this is all practice. We got solid penetration all the way through. At least uh, this isn't the worst of our problems. I have a feeling that once we start welding this together, we're gonna really forget about what these ones look like by comparison. So, either way, here's how we're going to attack this one. Now, I would probably go as far as to say that this is the most difficult part of the entire. Uh, process here is getting this first bead laid down and this is your edge weld now the trick to the edge weld is uh, commitment is basically the way that I can put it or the best way that I can put it when I teach people how to do this you really need a lot of focus you need a lot of fine control and you need to commit to it you need enough heat to get the rod melted and, the, and a puddle formed on it but you can't have too much and you can't go slow otherwise you're gonna burn that that side off of there or that edge off of there and turn the whole thing into hot snot which is basically basically the point of no return. So you have to basically get in it, get moving on it, keep an insanely tight amount of focus on that arc and just get moving on it. Now at this point here, we're gonna see the arc is gonna jump over from one side of the throat to the other, the side that I'm working on and it's gonna jump to the other one. It's just the way that it works. I'm not gonna fight it, I'm just gonna utilize it. I'm gonna allow that arc to fan out to both sides and I'm gonna make sure that I push enough filler rod in there so it actually fills and builds up on both edges and makes that throat even smaller, thus moving it up. As soon as I have that, I'm gonna flip it around, run up the other side with another edge weld and keep on repeating that process because it's going to make the throats more narrow and it's going to make the sides or the biggest part of the gap build in on each other just a little bit more each time. Now when it comes to adding more filler and getting more and more and more in there, you, you're going to find a point where it's going to you're, you're basically going to look for that gooey point where it's going to put a lot of mass on there and a lot of filler metal in there. And that's when you know that you've got it just right and keep it there. Don't worry about making pretty beads or dimes and stuff like that, but just, just get in there and get moving. Now, at the point where I've got it to where the gap is kind of minimalized and I can't build a lot more, I'm going to move uh, right up to the center or the widest point in the gap and I'm going to slowly dab up a bridge. Now, the purpose of the bridge is basically to hold everything together when you actually go to make the big fill on it to actually fill in the big part of it. So 
in order to make this work, you gotta build up one side, and when it gets too hot, you need to switch over to the other side and do the exact same thing. Once you have them connected, reinforce them only slightly, make sure you're paying attention to your heat control, and keep adding filler on there. Each time you add more filler, you know, you have a lot more metal to burn and blend in there, so your, your heat or your amperage is going to increase as you go along. This is definitely a very tricky part to do, but once you got it, you're set. All right, so we got a little bit of a bridge going on here, and the most important thing that we gotta pay attention to now is letting it cool down, because this thing's gonna get hot, and the hotter it is, the more likely you're gonna hit hot snot, which means this thing's just gonna go and fall apart. So you wanna make sure that you let it cool down. Uh, if you gotta quench it, go ahead and quench it, whatever the case is, just make sure you let it cool down enough to where you can start firing back on it again and start piling up all of that filler again, because we basically need to start working our way either from the throat where actually we had the good weld and start weaving and kind of filling it back in or we can go from this bridge on down one way or the other it doesn't really matter we're just trying to fill it in with enough now i'm going to try and uh, switch up to some 332 or some bigger stuff here to uh, to fill it in but you might see it it might happen to me i'm not sure yet but if it does if it turns into kind of like that little sausage casing or you just see all these little little tails and stuff growing off of it then we know that we need to kind of bring it back down to a smaller filler rod diameter so that way we can get individual little puddles on each one of them don't try to get too much rod in there at once otherwise it's going to uh, oxidize and solidify all funky and you know you're gonna have to pump put so much freaking heat into this thing in order to uh to get it right so Either way, after we let it cool a little bit, let's just fire right back into this thing and see if we can get it to build up and work and weave it back and forth. Let's see if the 332 is going to be polite. I don't know. It will help you out tremendously if you're just honest with yourself. If you try to get too much filler rod in there, it's going to solidify immediately and it's going to you're going to lose basically uh, all of your gas coverage because it's going to build up so fast and it's it's literally just going to fall apart on you. So, if you can't maintain with a larger diameter or you can't get it hot enough to where you can still keep it in control, switch to a smaller filler rod diameter. But either way, I'm basically starting on one side and I'm working in one direction. I'm going to start on my right, I'm going to dab it in as I go along as I move and then I'm going to, as soon as I get to the left, I'm basically going to stop it there, switch back over to the right and move the same direction again. This allows it to cool evenly and allows me to maintain my heat as I'm going in there. Now this doesn't really look all that pretty. We're getting a whole lot of metal in there and really I could probably... I could probably do a lot less, but once it got down to the end of it here, I'm basically going to feed the filler rod in there and just walk the cup back and forth and move it back and forth until it finally fills in. <laughs> so yeah, that's about uh, super fugly. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, what do you expect, right? Big clumpy disaster? Look, I'll be straight up with you. I've never really done this before. I've bridged some gaps before, but nothing like this. So at the end of the day, it's there. I'm sure it'll hold. There's a lot of metal on there, right? Uh, but let's, let's try to dress this up. I'm literally going to shoot from the hip on this one. Maybe it's going to make the episode a little bit longer here, but I'm just going to try it. I want to try and mow this down a little bit. I want it to look a little more uniform than the little weave of clumpy disaster that I have on there. That just looks foul. So um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drop my uh, AC frequency. I'm going to go down to maybe, I don't know, 40 hertz or so, right? I want it to get low and gooey. And around the edges on the, on the sides, I'm going to back off the amperage. And in the middle, I'm going to hammer down on it. And I'm just going to run it back and forth to see if I can get this thing to uh, kind of mow down or, or normalize uh, on the look side of things, I guess. Because, you know, we did pretty good on this one. But, uh, yeah, turn that over and that's just foul. So let's make that attempt. I, I'm just going to try it. Well, you know what? Let's do it. So this is entirely for the purpose of experimentation, so feel free to absolutely destroy this weld in the comments. I can take it. 
I know it's not pretty, but uh, when you're doing this, uh, you might uh, d discover some things about your weld. Maybe uh, maybe you got a, had a hole in it or a pocket or something that blows out, or maybe it's just going to destroy itself. So make sure you have some filler rod at the ready. I didn't have to use it until I got to the end where it was starting to really sink in just a little bit because the heat was catching up to it. But, uh, you know, just make sure you got some at the ready and if you try to do this. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess yeah, I guess it's a little bit more uniform. What do you think? Well, kind of looks like a cockroach or something. This is just <laughs> so I'm not totally sure or sold on the fact that this is an excellent uh, representation of uh, or situation when you would do this because I know in my mind this is just me talking here that. Uh, there's no way in hell I'm going to let a fit up this bad go on to like a customer's car or something. But I do know that in the real world of welding, you're not always going to get that perfect fit up. So it may not be something exactly like this, but theoretically with what we've shown in this video, you should probably get a pretty good grasp on how to manage a, uh, a bad fit up or to bridge a gap in thin aluminum at least. You know, uh, I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if this actually helped you out or worked for you. Maybe we can revisit this again. But that is going to wrap it up for this episode. And I want to thank you guys for watching as always if you need to get in contact with us hit me up on the fabricationseries.com website instagram at the dot fabricator or facebook.com slash the fabricator series now make sure you subscribe and ring that bell for notifications and check out some of the other awesome content that we have to go on here so i'm getting out of here thanks again as always we'll see you guys in the next episode